uh, today's session is sort of, uh, here's what, uh, who, actually, let me step back here. Who has heard the phrase, artificial intelligence is going to change government as we know it? Who has heard the phrase like, machine learning is the next uh, revolution? We have a co-presenter here, King Rao. Uh, you know, you've seen, who, who's heard the term like data science and the people have been saying like, it's gonna automate away all the jobs, like nobody's gonna have to work anymore, which would be great. I would like not to have to work anymore. Uh, probably a little more complex than that. So uh, this talk is a lot about peeling back the onion so that you have an intuition when somebody says AI, it's not just a black box. Uh, when somebody says data science, you kind of understand like you're not doing data science. Like you don't have to do it, but you understand like what a data scientist does, what a data engineer might do, and like what are the types of algorithms we use, and like what are the impacts of them. Uh, that being said, uh, we have to ask a fundamental question to start this. So we have a little bit of a e uh, participatory exercise to get started that we like to call "Is it data?" So um, if you could break into like small three, four-person groups just with your immediate row. Um, and we're going to show a couple examples and ask you to explain why something is or is not data. Yeah, and this gets directly at the heart of what Hunter was just talking about. Before we figure out what's data science and all these black boxes, let's be on the same page with we all understand what data is. Because I think there's a lot of different interpretations and ideas out there. So Cool. So uh, everybody see their groups, see the people next to them. You can introduce yourselves. All right, you ready for slide number one? Is it data? Browser usage, so it's a little bit old, 2014, but uh, what do we think, yes or no? Head nods, yes, yes. Okay. Who says yes? Who's Why? Why do you think this is data? What's? Uh, I would say I was breaking up if you want to know in which user browsers Okay, so you can kind of look at this, make some judgments, make some assumptions, some conclusions. Sure. I'm just going to play devil's advocate just for a moment. Uh, I think this is not data. This is just a pie chart based on some data. You would be exactly correct there, sir. Uh, so we would consider this a, a data visualization, a pie chart to be specific. But there was some numbers, there were some rows that went into creating this pie chart, right? But if we started to break this pie chart down, just ask some basic questions. Like there's this other category, right? That little s sliver of orange. Well, what does others mean? What goes into others? We can't tell just from looking at the pie chart. We need the underlying data, right? So data visualization. Let's try, right. another, Let's try another round. Monthly cash flows. Who's seen something that looks like this? Everybody needs to have their hand up right now. <laughs> you, you're managing elections governments. We've definitely seen stuff like this. Uh, so is this data? Yes. Some yes. No. Yes. yes. Anybody want to explain yes? Anybody? Are you going with no now? Okay. So can we get one person to explain why they think it's yes and please introduce yourself first? All right. Hi. What's your name? Rebecca Friedman, the Human Services Director at USC. So really, I have no experience in knowing what I'm talking about. <laughs> but I feel like everything is data in the way that everything is matter. I just have to know that. That's like, it's a very existential argument. I kind of like it. Yeah. Um, all right, who does not think this is data? Who's got no? So you got no over, what? yes? Do you want to explain why you think it's not data? All right, so we've got smattering some some yes, no's. So I would not call this data. And again, depends how you want to, but this is not data, this is a report. Um, so with a report like this, there's a system where, you know, you, uh, you know, kept track of how much cash you got in, you know, where you manage your payments. There's a bank account like that exists somewhere where there's like rows of data actual representing the transaction to each occurred. individual transaction. And then we made a report with that transaction. Somebody wrote logic 
to determine how many actual fees did we receive in that month? How much did we, but you know, there's probably a budget system too. And they wrote something in there and then they wrote a bit of business logic. They wrote code. It was code somewhere, whether it was in Excel, Excel is code too, or in um, a programming language to determine what the variance was for each of those columns. And again, so this is like a report and typically you use data to generate a report, but the report itself, again, depends how you want to define data, but like from the perspective of like doing data science and doing machine learning, this is not data. This is interesting. It's the output, right? It's the this output. for humans to look at yeah. the, the analysis of the data, right? You want to say something? Just really quick to remind you, please turn on your microphone and speak into the microphone when you're uh, making comments so we can all hear. So press the little button that has the face on it and your microphone should turn red. Oh, great. Okay, Sorry. I was, yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. But so if you had a monthly report, you know, if you're doing annual, you could, you know, do like multiple levels of summary where you take, you know, the transaction data to make the monthly report and then take the monthly data. But if you had to actually like sit down and write this, this would involve, you know, figuring out the logic to take monthly, you know, versus annual is really just a time. Like you can parameterize that in a way, like if you want to depending on how your annual report is structured, but if it's just the same thing over a year versus 30 days, it could be, again, it's, this is all, this is not an exact science. Uh, obviously this is like categorizing things, uh, which is a little rough, but like for the purposes of this, this is really a report that is designed for humans. I'm just trying to stress that like, yes, it could be data for another system, but it is, there is something behind this thing that is closer to a representation of stuff that happened. So would it just be called raw data? So what would be creating this report right. would be raw so data. So couldn't sure. this be data, but not raw data? If, if we want to get to that level of classifying <laughs> things, sure. But I think the point what we're showing here is we could ask questions about this. Like, how does this compare to last month? And given this report, the only way to do that is pull last month out of the drawer. Now I'm a human comparing two pieces of paper manually. I could make a mental math error. I could, oh wait, no, now I want to do the last 12 months. I'll go to my filing cabinet, get the last 12 months out, flip through pages. That's not data. If we have to manually flip, flip through paper and do manual calculations in our head, that's further removed from data than if we have rows in a spreadsheet and we just apply a formula to automatically do the monthly calculation, automatically do the yearly roll up or whatever it is, right? So I think that's the distinction we're trying to make here. So example number three, we have a map here that shows uh, some points uh, involving homelessness increases and decreases reporting. Any guesses? Who, who, who said yes? Please turn on your microphone if you wanna. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm saying no, it's not data. It's information using data Geographical data. <laughs> Any other? I'm going with the flow. <laughs> you go. Yeah. I would say that it is data, but also a data visualization because you can see the individual points, and therefore you can technically see the individual lines of data in in a way. It's just not a spreadsheet, so you should be able to download the information on this into a spreadsheet, uh, and it'd be the same information just in a different way. So I would say it is data. I think we're kind of saying the same things over and over and that's the point of this, honestly, and that's fine. But again, I think we would classify this as a further step removed from that raw data that went into it. You know, there was a latitude and a longitude. There was some notion of a report. Well, what does that report mean? Where did that report come from? Is there a number that indicates an increase or a decrease? So we took that stuff and plopped it on a map and now we can see where these increases are happening but again if we ask a simple question like what state is seeing the biggest increase well we could count green dots by hand but imagine we're looking at every county in the united states we're not going to count green dots by hand for hundreds of thousands of counties or whatever it is right so okay last example kind of getting the gist of where we're going here how about this one 
It's just... uh, all right. I think we heard the key answer here, which is, all right, we're finally at like a table. It kind of like, looks like it should it be. Kind of, right? right? Like, we got to this point of like, uh, the most, what was it? What did you just say? Can you speak into the. Uh... Yeah. I, the first thing I said was, why is it a PDF? And the second thing I said, like, this data is stored in the most useless, like, file Thank format you. humanly <laughs> possible. You hit the nail on the head exactly. <laughs> PDFs are not data, folks. <laughs> Hate to break it to you. <laughs> PDFs are meant to be printed. They're meant to be, you know, looked at when you're sitting up on a council dais or something like that. And that's good. They're useful. We need them. We need to share that information, but we but can't do analysis on a PDF. Yeah. So in your roles as like managers and electeds, when you have reports, you know, when you have data analysts, when you have systems analysts, when you say, I want data, you may have actually been saying, I want information. I want a report. I want a visualization. And then to me, I'm like, great. You want like, you know, uh, I'm working on a project involving dockless scooters and bikes. And, you know, I'll hear like from, you know, the person who's managing the program, like I want data on this. And I'm like, great, I can give you, you know, millions of trip records. I can, I don't know what you're gonna do with it. <laughs> like, it's, it's probably not what he's, you know, really asking for. And because we use the data, the word data to kind of refer to everything, it kind of means then anything that depends on data, like AI, like machine learning, like data science, Nobody actually knows what they're asking for. So we wanted to like unroll and like be for the purposes of this talk and like for thinking about some of these things. When we talk about data, we're really talking about that raw level information that represents something that had happened in the world. Um, so um, I think this is where we kind of transition um, and to talk about like, okay, this like machine learning uh, moment, like everybody's talking about it and, you know, it's a big, buzzword in Silicon Valley. It's a big buzzword in government now about like how we can do machine learning to improve our services and everything. Uh, you've seen that um, uh, we've really been unlocking, you know, if you're a theoretician, you know, with uh, deep learning and all sorts of stuff, we finally go, which was this it's a, uh, Chinese uh, game of uh, similar to chess uh, is much, much harder to model from a computer standpoint. We got good at chess and computers in the 90s. Go is something to the order of 10 to the 64th power more complex in terms of number of moves. So it was very hard to model out in computers. Like we just didn't have enough space on computers to model Go the way we did in modeled chess. Uh, but we've since invented mathematical techniques that have become very good where uh, we've been able, a computer beat the world champion in Go uh, recently. And then there's the flip side of artificial intelligence. Who remembers this? What happened? It, it learned off of the internet and became terribly racist uh, <laughs> and, 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 and said terrible, terrible things. Yeah, so this was a Microsoft project called Tate.ai. It learned how to respond uh, from humans on Twitter and then humans on Twitter were terrible to it and then it became terrible. Uh, and I think this is like an important lesson to learn anytime tells, pitches you about like, let's use AI to do something in government because if it's already terrible, so again, like this huge, again, we will only be uh, pouring uh, gasoline on the fire, as if you will, and sort of I'll, hopefully by the end of the talk, you'll understand why it's gasoline on the fire. Uh, so again, like Watson Jeopardy, you know, uh, let's see, you know, robots, LA Times, robots are coming for jobs, can machine learning help end China's smog problem? Um, you know, uh, Machine learning is Google's secret cloud weapon. Honestly, I don't know what that sentence means, Forbes. Um, but, you know, the big thinker types are like, in a year you can do use machine learning to do something better than what humans are can doing. Um, every successful app is using machine learning. These quotes are now like four years, three, four years old. So like the revolution is mid progress. Um, you know, people are talking about what has historically been companies, you know, that competing on like, how best can I be a cab company? And they're now saying, well, this is really, you know, Uber versus Lyft is a competition to see who can more successfully route cars to get people to their destination. Um, and again, the flip side of this very positive coin is some other folks, uh, some who might want to be tunneling underneath downtown Los Angeles, um, think we're summoning the demon. Uh, and uh, Stephen Hawking says the end of human race. So quite a lot of things. So there's two things that are really present in this narrative 
around machine learning and data science. One, machine learning can do the impossible, can solve all your terrible tasks, it's gonna fix everything. And the other thing is that machine learning is impossible to do. You need six PhDs and seven disciplines. You need to have been coding since you were three and a half years old. And you know, it costs a million dollars to hire one person who can do machine learning. And that they're these magic robots, these like, it's in really impressive magic machines, you know, there's these guys, there's vendors who happen to like coming to me and wanting to sell, like, we're gonna machine learn. What's your biggest problem? And you say, my problem, my biggest problem is potholes, let's say. I am going to use machine learning to solve your pothole problem. Go to the next town, it's, uh, if you are a Simpsons fan like me, it's like the monorail solution, except machine learning taking the place of the monorail. Um, so my goal is um, that everyone leaves this room understanding how machine learning kind of works and a process or initiative or thing you are doing in your job currently where you think you can use machine learning to help do something better. And it's going to be, it might be small, it might be very technocratic and change, but I think it's a very powerful way to sort of unpack this. So again, this is what people think a data scientist in government does. You know, we stare at, you know, code all day. We have access to all this information, this like panopticon. Uh, I guess I lost that second slide. What we really do is follow up asking for data um, mostly, but what is going on under the hood? Why are we asking for all this data? Why do we want all that data that we've asked for? That we have today, like now you know what data is. Now, why are we asking for it? And it's machine learning is using data to identify patterns and make decisions. That's all that's going on here. It's you take information about the past, you identify the patterns in it. We do this, humans do this very well and intelligently. This is actually why machine learning is super hard is like, if you, does everybody check Google Maps in the morning before they go to the office? Uh, this is actually fairly recent development. Most people would just like used to, you know how long it's gonna take you to get to the office, right? You've driven that route before. Like you took your knowledge of how long it takes you to get to the office and how long, it, you know, which route you're gonna take and you just do it because you've ha lived that pattern. Machine learning is just teaching a computer to do that exact same thing. So, you know, in Pedro Dominguez in his book, A Few Things to Know About Machine Learning, which I recommend if you kind of want to get like a little bit deeper dive into this is all machine learning do is, is figuring out how to do an important task by generalizing from past example. So just myths and misconceptions you may have heard. Uh, machine learning requires super intelligence to understand and use. You can sub in data science and AI essentially pretty much anywhere in this talk here. So, you know, I'm just trying to stick to one word. Um, I should probably move it to AI because it's now the most buzzy. Uh, but back when I wrote this talk, it was machine learning was the most buzzy term. So, you know, most people, um, the most important part of machine learning is the algorithms and software. And it matters if you choose Python versus R versus SAS and you need to like get, you know, a Hadoop cluster, you know, I don't know. There's a lot of things um, and that they're perfect. These like algorithms are like the best thing ever. They don't make mistakes. Um, the flip side of that is also you can't trust them. Like their outputs are non-deterministic, which uh, like in a mathematical sense, like you cannot determine how the, the outputs are gonna always be. Um, and that they're, you just can't get behind, you can't unpack, unpack the box. Yes. But I'm gonna tell you something. Computers are dumb, and this means everything you really need to know about machine learning, every company that says they're doing machine learning in AI, every single feature, you know, in Google, Apple, Facebook, et al, that uses machine learning is really just doing something your kindergartner could do. If, or if you don't have a kindergarten, you learned in kindergarten. So who did this in kindergarten? Who drove, who drew lines through a dots? Like you had to connect the dots, right? All right, that's regression. That's all that's going on. When somebody says they're using regression or I'll give you a list of all these different things we call regression, all they're doing is drawing a line through a, through a set of dots and dots are data points. Um, so to take an example, um, there was a, there's an app called Maple. What they do is they make lunch, you know, fancy lunch for cheap. And one of the things that their competitive advantage is in a Chipotle, which is considered like the gold standard in the restaurant industry for the number of meals you can serve in an hour, they serve about 300 meals. A Chipotle running at peak capacity can do about 300 meals an hour, which is pretty crazy when you actually think about that. That means they're making approximately one, one burrito every 15 seconds. 
Mabel would do, uh, per kitchen, would do about 1,200, 1,100 uh, meals per hour. So you're like, how do you do that? You know, how do you do that? And it's, um, you can predict how many meals you need to make. And then you can just start making them in advance. You can pre-prep. You know, if I knew that 85 customers are going to come in in the next hour, I can make 85 burritos right up there at that second. I can be more efficient with limited resources. So you make this curve. You plot this. This is like a chart like this where it's like, here's the number of orders per hour I saw on different days. And it follows like, anybody see a pattern here? Like orders peak around lunchtime. <laughs> you know, here's the number. It's really shocking. Um, but when you're talking about like machine learning, we have like a language to describe how to think or AI, like uh, think about these things. So, you know, what the thing that we're trying to predict, we always call the label. So we're trying to predict the orders in the next hour at 11. I need to start my order prep for the 11 o'clock hour, you know, or at 1030, I want to predict how many orders I'm going to receive at 11 o'clock or 1201, you know, whatever that is. And then I need a number of features. So I might say, how many orders did I get in the last hour? What day of the week is it? What's my current menu? How many, uh, is it raining or not? You know, are people more, you know, all these things might matter. So you have features predicting your label. So when people say features and labels, that's what's, all it is, is the things that are informing my prediction and the thing I'm trying to predict. So how would I do this prediction? So I'd take the number of orders, I'd take my historical data set, and I'm just going to plot on the y-axis, I'm going to put the number of orders in the next hour. And in the x-axis, I'm going to put the number of orders in the previous hour. And I'm going to fit that curve. I'm going to draw this line. This so is just, historical data. So we know yeah, the previous and the yeah, next, right? Yeah, so it's, it's historical. Again, we have just features and labels. And again, as I said, we're just generalizing from example. And I now have that fit that curve. So if it's the next hour, and all I know is the number of order hours, if it's now 11 o'clock, and I'm trying to predict how many orders I'm going to have by 12, I can I have that line. I can just fit that curve, and I, it will say, well, you're probably going to have, if your x value is 10, your y value is probably going to be 12, or whatever it is. That's all regression algorithm is doing under the hood. But you're like, Hunter, how do I test this? Do I just wait and sit around and keep track of my progress? No, like we've got better techniques than that. So rather than try, so it's not like you just make one, put it out into production, see if it works and then come back. What you do with your historical data set is you hide some of the data. So this is called building the training and test split. Um, so what you do is if you say had a year's worth of historical data here, you can see that we um, split the data or five years um, and uh, then said, well, I'm going to try and successfully predict the fifth year using only data from the fourth year. And you might want to do cross validation. There's all sorts of ways you can split this and split it in many ways to make sure you're right. Like, let's just say you're not going to be the, look, you, you in the, this room are not going to be doing this. Like this is going to be somebody else's job. And I just want you to know what they're trying to do. <laughs> uh, so what you do is you say, okay, what would year five look like using my first four years of data? I draw that line. And then I say, how, well, now I can pull in that data that already exists, that old historical data. And I said, oh, this algorithm, this, these set of parameters, these features were successful or not successful at predicting that label of orders in the next hour. So all that going on. So things you may have heard of, or has anybody heard of any of these? Some of these, this might like back to like an early public policy textbook has some of these. Um, haven't thought about these in a few years, some, some faces I can see, um, like typically, you know, again, there's a lot of different ways to draw the curve, how to fit, what you're trying to optimize for. These all carry different trade-offs, but like you can get a lot of stuff out of OLS, just an ordinary least squares reduction, um, random forest regressions. It's like, you do not like all of these exist. And the great thing is like any machine learning tool that you get, will have all of these out of the box. You don't have to worry about like how to write one of these algorithms. You just like grab them out of the box and just what you have to do is just fit it onto your data. So an example from my past work uh, working with the Data Science for Social Good Fellowship on this um, is uh, predicting how many bikes are gonna be at a Divi station the next hour. So this is like for government. So uh, Divi is Chicago's equivalent of Metro Bike Share, um, which is a bike share system. And in a bike share system, you have two conditions that are bad, right? 
you can go to a dock and there's no bikes there. And you're like, well, I can't get a bike now. That's not good. And you can go to, you can have a bike and get to a dock and it's full. And suddenly you can't put your bike away and you need to go to the next nearest dock, which can, can get extra fees. They are bad conditions. They're things we want to avoid. So in order to avoid this, any bike share operator engages in a practice known as rebalancing. So what they do is they go around to full docks and empty docks. They remove bikes from the full docks and put bikes into the, you know, uh, empty docks. Pretty simple process. But the problem is typically that means they're working in a reactive state. They're waiting for it to be full. And then they got to get somebody typically in rush hour traffic, you know, across the Chicago loop to unload or load in bikes. But, you know, we can sit and say, there's probably a pattern here, right? Like, Certain stations are going to fill up at certain hours. There'll be certain conditions, you know, maybe when it rains, it's slightly different stations because like we have some features. What are some potential features you might think would predict whether a station would be full or empty? Time of day? Season? Weather? Weather kind of, that's a proxy, you know, proxy features. We can talk about like location, super important feature for a lot of the reasons. So, Using two features here, we can actually build a pretty solid model of how many bikes are going to be in here. So all we did is, the, all this plot is, is the average number of bikes in uh, a station and uh, what hour of the day it is. And then you can see the green curve represents a residential station and the blue curve represents a downtown station. What do people see going on? Yeah. It's, it's literally, you just see people. So again, these patterns are easily generalizable and then we can build models and we can, you know, and if you were in the systems track, you'd be hearing about how to get those models into people's hands so that you can know this station before it's even full is filling up. Like you should probably get to this station today or, you know, in the next hour. Another useful prediction is how much money are you going to save with your new Nest thermostat? Um, so you could potentially, uh, the goal of this project was so that a, you can actually securitize and discount a Nest thermostat knowing how much power is going to be saved. Super important for power efficiency. So rather than, um, so it's like, well, you have a three bedroom house, you're in uh, Yukaipa or you're in the west side, you might use more AC or less AC. So we notice, you know, these types of houses are going to save this amount, of, you know, your historical power bill is looks like this. Once you get a nest, because we've had other examples of people getting nests, we can now predict how much you're going to save. And then once we know how much you're going to save, like we can help incentive, you know, use that to pay for a program just to install those because power savings are actually very valuable for a number of reasons um, that are like mysteries of the municipal power market to me, but utility regulators tell me these things. So that's regression, drawing the lines for the dots. But that's not, you're not always trying to predict a number. Um, sometimes you need to predict a category. Um, so if you're trying to predict a category, uh, you might need to, you need to cut things. Essentially, you need to figure out exactly, you know, everything to the left of this area is in category A, everything to the right of this area is in category B. So we call these family, the family of algorithms that does this like classification algorithms. So if you are the foundation center, you have every single federal and state grant issued over like a 40 year period. And, but if you look at a grant, it looks something like this. Uh, it's, uh, this is from the upper San Gabriel water valleys. They issued a 2014 to 2015 program guidelines. Um, uh, you know, where it's, uh, it's a written document, a grant. And there's, they have hundreds of thousands of these, like way more than any, you know, if one human had to read all of these, they'd be here from, here till now. So the question is like, is this data? It's information. Right. So there's like a little bit. So there's like information and data contained within here. Like, oh, I know there's a date I want to extract 2014 to 2015. It's but uh, if you can imagine having hundreds of thousands of these be very hard to figure out like what category of grant everything is. Cause it's not like you have a nice table saying grant one is category A, grant two is category B. So there's a way to figure out how to make these cuts using a computer rather than using a human, which is really important when you have hundreds of thousands. So 
you know, a simple model to do this is if I wanted to predict whether a grant was an art education grant or a sustainability education grant, I could count the number of times the word painting was mentioned in the grant, and I could count the number of times the word water was mentioned in the grant. And you can see that X, Y, those points represent, you know, how many times you saw the word painting and how many times you saw the word water. And if I, you can draw that line um, to split those two cat, and then you suddenly have a model that if I gave you those two counts could predict whether you have an arts education grant or a water education, sustainability education grant. And you can do this with like a much more complex like series of trees making hundreds of these decisions, you know, rather than just one um, to end up sorting things. So classification is used um, to really predict whether something is in a different category or not. You can do it on like labeled versus unlabeled data. So when you don't, um, some of the big algorithms you might have heard is like support vector machines, uh, a classification regression tree, k-nearest neighbor classification is really a big one about basically identifying like where in this like space, like a matrix space, uh, things are near each other. Um, random forests, another big one. So some examples for why you might want to classify uh, things is if you are the Environmental Protection Agency, this is again going back to uh, some of the work I did in data science for social good, is if you're the Environmental Protection Agency, um, you have a limited number of facilities you can expect each year. Uh, you are going to want to classify them into high risk and low risk facilities. You might not know, you know, uh, and you can then, you know, sort of figure out where exactly you want to send based on like features like number of toxic chemical spills, helps you target your limited number of inspection resources. Uh, this is a really big project. Can you classify students, uh, whether they're at risk of dropping out early? So I want to say will drop out, you know, my categories are will drop out early, will not drop out early. Cause if I know if somebody will drop out early, suddenly, well, I can tell counselors that I can tell teachers that like that is useful information and we can know exactly how close they are to, you know, dropping out. Um, if you have an outreach, who's, who works at an agency that runs some sort of outreach program? Talks to people. Yeah. Like who exactly do I need to do outreach to? Like who is actually in need? If you are get covered Illinois and enroll America, you have a hundred people who are calling, uh, offering people health insurance with, this was the early rollout of Obamacare. Um, you can't call everybody in the state of Illinois. Like it's just, there's, with 100 people, you're not gonna call everybody in the state of Illinois. But you can call the 5% that actually need to get enrolled. So how can you predict who that 5% is so that you're most effectively targeting your outreach? You don't wanna be throwing darts at a board. Um, or if you are throwing darts at a board, you at least wanna start getting better at throwing those darts at the board at, over time. So, this is when you have like clearly labeled data um, where you clearly know what you're trying to target. Um, sometimes you don't have clearly labeled data and you need to chain these algorithms together. So sometimes you need to find patterns by fitting your data into buckets. This is like sorting Legos. You know, here are the six piece Legos, here are the, you know, two piece Legos, here are the, you know, uh, blocks, you know. Uh, you need to split it into different buckets rather than predicting which category, you know, where you already have a labeled category. This is when you have a, you don't know what your categories are. Um, so this is famously the Mickey Mouse data set, which kind of does a good job of like illustrating like how, uh, which is a bunch of points in a space. So it's uh, the X axis is zero to one. The Y axis is zero to one. And you can see you like roughly have the shape of Mickey Mouse here. Um, uh, it, with k-means clustering, it's using the k-means uh, k distance, it's like math to figure out, uh, we said, we have three buckets here. How similar are, is any point to any other point? And cr create three buckets and you can see it somewhat finds the ear, but it kind of, you know, cause it's a random distribution of points kind of to look like Mickey Mouse. You can kind of lops off, k-means as you can see, lops off a good portion of the head as part of the ear. And then EM clustering for a variety of reasons, like works more efficaciously on this particular data set in terms of like figuring out without knowing, like the thing is, is the computer does not know like what's the right ear, what's the left ear and what's the head. We just said, there's three buckets you need to make. Here's your similarity metric, figure out exact which points fall into bucket A, bucket B, bucket C. So some algorithms you might see for this, k-means, k-medians, um, 
hierarchical clustering. Again, ton of these, don't really need to worry about it. They're all just clustering algorithms. So a way you might want to use modeling to do this is like what local businesses have the highest growth rate. Um, you can figure out like, well, what first, you know, what are my business clusters? Like nobody has defined business clusters. Like that is not a thing that exists, but you do have like, let's say a bunch of business licenses and what industry they're in. So you can start to make those clusters using a similarity metric. Do nonprofits in a similar area have like similar mission statements and Twitter followers? Like you don't know what the network of nonprofits is. So the machine has actually learned just by looking at those two data points that these are nonprofits involved in these various spaces. These are the buckets that it is creating. And then sometimes you have too much data. So sometimes you have to squish everything down. Like if you actually think about going back to that, remember that grants example where we're talking about, we were only counting the number of mentions of two different words. We just said the two, the two pieces of that model, the two features are number of mentions of the word water and number of mentions of the word painting. But when you think about it, oh Lord, there's hundreds of unique words in this document. So especially when you're working with documents or text data, it's really important. Sometimes you got to squish it down to figure out like which, why is water and painting important? But the word, you know, year 2012 is not important. So again, we want to get down to this two dimensions so we can run our classification algorithms for a variety of like, this is how algorithms work. So we can use dimensionality reduction to figure out which of these parts are important and we can squish our data into something that's easy to use in one of the other types of algorithms. So uh, principal component analysis is kind of the big boy in this field. Um, and it kind of does what it says. It figures out what is the most important components of your list of many components. So common reasons you might want to do this is deciding what matters most, selecting these features. Like I don't care about the word, you know, grant because everything has the word grant in it. Uh, finding new things that might matter. Um, it turns out that if you book a hotel, like it might also matter if you book airfare within 10 days or whatever those things are, you can use this to find those patterns. Uh, and then the other things are finding products and people's like all your recommended uh, recommender type systems where it's like people have bought X, Y, and Z. Uh, will they, are they likely to buy A, B, and Z? Because that is a huge multi-dimensional space. Uh, all recommendation systems really use you might like this video on Netflix. Yeah. Your friend watched this one and you watched these ones and you gave this one a rating. So like an example here being like, what is a customer's likely movie reading for a movie that they haven't watched? Like looking at my past history of a Netflix customer, what would I probably rate this? And then I can show the customer the ones I would rate higher. Um, recently, you've probably heard about deep learning, or if you're, people are saying deep learning a lot, you may have heard like the word TensorFlow. Essentially what this is, is you create a bunch of people playing the game of telephone. You have these like miniature neurons, essentially, things that just go on or off. Uh, you can have hundreds, thousands of these inside your computer, a representation of it. And it's by telling the model what you want to learn, like I want to learn what faces are, and keeping to flip those on and off, it creates, you have an input layer, which is people's faces. You have an output layer, which is, is this a face or not? And you have all these hidden layers that are breaking it up into somewhat random parts and turning it on and off and just seeing what makes the most successful output. Uh, again, this is still, recently it's become more popular, but you need a truly massive amount of data, like terabytes minimum amount of data to really do deep learning. The only real practical application of this you see in government right now is basically all these video data extraction systems that you can buy from cloud vendor. Like if you have some sort of system that picks up people typically like this is a car or this is a bicycle or this is a, um, the only sort of data set we have access to as governments that is this big <laughs> is video feeds. Um, and you can use it to like basically count things. That's all you can really do. Like, this is really interesting, and if I wanted to go get a PhD, you can go get a PhD in this. Um, I still don't have the math to do this, um, but we were like limited for a long time, but the real practical implication of this for like everybody here in this room is like, we're getting really good at teaching computers to recognize things in videos. Uh, this is like a famous like computer science in-joke that in 1979, they thought they hired a, two undergraduates were hired by Dartmouth by a famous professor of computer vision to say, can you train, a, we were able to train a computer to recognize whether a cat was in a video or not. We already did the cat. We can train it to recognize all objects in the summer. 
this has never really happened. Like the thing is, is like computers are like very good at doing things with like an individual example, but like recognizing anything is so much more complex. So the joke was it started as a summer project and it's still like became a huge study of research. Like, and we've kind of recently started getting good at it for deep learning reasons. The basic reason why this all got good was Google images happened, um, was like suddenly somebody had a database of almost every image that had been put on the public internet. And then you, then like all these sort of mathematical techniques that were actually very bad at working with hundreds of gigabytes of data actually work really well with terabytes up worth of data. Uh, this is an interesting side detour, but the only like real important thing to do is like realize that we're very good at recognizing things from image streams now. And it's fairly cheap to like pay a big cloud provider or pay a vendor to like go look at video and automatically recognize things without them actually having to pay somebody to sit there and look at video. All right, that's a lot. There were a lot of algorithms. There was some terms running around. There's a little bit of math. Um, the big thing here is like, there's kind of just um, a couple things you can do. Like all machine learning is, is doing one of these few things using some of these algorithms. And you can kind of figure out what you might want to do by figuring out like just some basic rules, which is like, it, do I have more than 50 samples of data? If I don't have more than 50 observations, 50 rows in a spreadsheet. Yeah, if you don't have 50 rows in a spreadsheet, if you have 50 rows in a spreadsheet, look at the spreadsheet. <laughs> like, you can figure out what you need by looking at it. Okay. Like, computers are not going to help you then. <laughs> so, like, go back to the start. Um, are you trying to predict a category or are you trying to predict a quantity? Uh, if you're trying to predict a category and you already know what those categories are, you can use classification. If you don't know what those categories are, you can use clustering. If you're trying to predict a quantity, you can use regression. Um, if you're not trying to predict the quantity and you're just trying to look and see what's important in data, you've got dimensionality reduction. And like all of these, this is a cheat sheet from scikit-learn. All of these are like out of the box included with free and open source software. Like you don't need to buy a license. You can just like, imp like if you want to sit at home and like implement one of these on your computer, like you can do it in like six lines of code. Um, there's also like more, you know, other types of cheat sheets that are useful. I keep one of these on my desk just to kind of think like which algorithms might I want to use for this particular problem. But it's not like one all powerful algorithm, like going back, like it's not one all powerful. It's just like a bunch of these sta stapled together that did well on the training data at predicting the test data, kind of all hooked into this frankly janky pipeline. It's not like some supercomputer algorithm. That's all that's going on underneath the hood. So hopefully there's like not a little bit less of a black box for machine learning right now. Um, so stopping there, I think the next set of slides is more like, how do I do this? How can I, what we want you to get for the rest of the workshop is go from, okay, I have kind of an understanding of what is going on now. Here is, uh, something I want to implement in my, you know, with my team in my job as a manager, or here's something I think might be useful for my organization. Um, to start that, I just kind of wanted to like, Reference that there are a bunch of high to low level tools. How much time we got left? I think we have 15 minutes. Is it right. till three? Yeah, I think we have, I think we have till 3.30. 3? 3.30? Oh, then we've got 45 minutes. All right, cool. So just to reference, like, there's, pro there's a lot of products. There's a lot of people. They, they sort of all operate on this, like, sort of you have lower level libraries, like Python and R and TensorFlow and Scikit-Learn, all the way to, like, automated solutions provided to you by a vendor like Amazon machine learning or, but at the end of the day, you're still, what you have to do is figure out how to take your data that is applicable to your problem and fit it to one of these, the algorithms are done. Like people smarter than anybody in this room, certainly smarter than me, solved the algorithms problem. What, the, what nobody has solved is like the data problem, which is like, how do you, which you, that's what you have to solve yourself is like getting your data into a point where you can make a prediction that is useful for you. So yeah, uh, machines are really stupid. Like describing data to them is really, you have to be very, very specific. And we're just trying to make it them a little bit less stupid. Um, so I really like this post from Surrey University about modeling and why you might want to model which is like, I keep saying predict the future. And I think you're kind of like, why do I need to know the future? Like there's actually a lot of different reasons why you might want to model something that are not uh, just about like predicting the future. 
Um, so you might want to explain something in the past. This is a very typical use of regression um, in like, you know, computer science papers. You want to say, here's how something's going. Uh, it, you might want to guide your data collection efforts by predicting what you know and don't know. You can then say, well, we don't have data on this. Um, you might want to um, illuminate uncertainties, like start, um, start to figure out like what is the core, uh, what are the things that you don't know? If we're unable to do the prediction, we've learned something just as much as if we are able to do the prediction. Um, and uh, sort of one of the things I think is uh, machine learning does a really good way of reveal that certain things are much simpler than people under uh, understand and certain things that people assume are very simple are actually quite complex, um, especially when it comes to data. So again, most of machine learning is still about human learning. Uh, it's still figuring out what your problem is. Uh, it's still figuring out what data do you have. It's mapping it to machine learning algorithms. It's working with the data. So I have some good news, everybody. Nobody is at risk of losing their job. Uh, we are not going to automate our way out of this problem. Um, this is still going to, there are still challenges for managers. There are still challenges for practitioners. There's still going to be a need to continue to do this moving forward. So when people talk about what data scientists do all day, this is sort of like what I think my parents think I do, which is, uh, I, I think they know that I'm not the last part because I work at a public agency. Um, but they think I spent some time working with data and then I'm like optimizing algorithms. I've got like the city's like massive Sim City, like just sitting at my desk, you know. Um, and like we're like, well, if we just tweak that one thing over there, like it will be 10% more efficient. And it's like, so this is like the like sort of stereotypical image. Um, or like if you're, you know, Facebook data scientist, they're like, well, if we adjust the color on the home page, we'll get 30% more views. Um, this is what you actually spend all your time doing. It's like, 90% of your time is just getting data to be data you can do machine learning with. Um, and then the last 10%, you get to optimize some algorithms and we don't get to be right. Um, so the reason why that's the case is those algorithms only understand one thing and one thing only. Who can tell me what's on the right there? More specifically? What is that specifically? What's it called from that? What's it called? Math people, somebody in the room. There's a movie by the same name. Yeah. Yes. Matrix, yes. So that's all. Every machine learning algorithm at, at its core is just doing matrix multiplication and matrix division. That's all that's going on. Just rows uh, and columns. Rows and columns. Uh, you can have, sometimes you have to represent multiple dimensions. So taking even what we call data, like a spreadsheet that might say, you know, a spreadsheet of like, if we go back to that PDF, you can imagine, you know, I'm not going to go all the way back there because as you can see, I have a lot of slides. Uh, but if we took you, even if we had that in a spreadsheet, that's still not a matrix. We still have to turn those, you know, into, did you get into the university? Was your GPA, you know, all of those need to be pure numbers. Like you can only put numbers in there. So you have to figure out how to represent everything into a matrix. So taking administrative records, which is on the left, and turning into matrices. That's like primarily the job of the data scientist. Our job is not around the algorithms. It is taking administrative records and turning them into matrices. And then uh, finally, the thing that is often the hardest about this is the implementation and change management phase. Um, the Hong Kong subway system like built an algorithm that would successfully predict which cha uh, trains needed matrix, uh, which trains needed ma uh, maintenance. They tested their algorithm, system looks good. So they took all their managers out of the train maintenance yards and they put in a fax machine. And I, I still can't believe it's a fax machine or like a printer. And it would just print out which trains needed ma maintenance. And like people just stopped doing the maintenance and like the work, like the change management is like really hard. I'm not, I don't have answers for like, how did you change management? Go to a different, there's other, other folks here who can tell you more about it. But like, once you have these algorithms, like I can't tell you how many projects in my life have made it up to everything looks good and works on the technical side. We've done the problem discovery. We found the data. We mapped it to a machine learning problem. We figured out how to turn them all into matrices and we found the best algorithm possible. And then we're like, okay, now people have to change how they do their jobs. Um, and like, we were not ready to do the change management part. So that is like, if I can take away like one thing, like what does being a manager in an AI or data science focused organization do? It means taking the results of these models and doing change management with them, uh, which is really hard. Um, so hopefully now that you understand a little bit of why this, this stuff is hard and what's going on, 
you are now more prepared to do change management. Uh, so what are computers good at? They're good at following instructions. They're good at trying out lots of uh, possibilities really quickly. And again, they're really good at doing matrix math, which is why we get all these fancy AI buzzwords going on right now. You still have to give the computer what to learn, how to learn it, and what to do when they're done learning. Um, we can figure out how we're right and wrong. There's a lot of different ways to evaluate these. Uh, measures of mean error, that's um, basically how far off the curve was I? If I drew the line, how, how much is the average distance between the actual point and the line? Um, as you can see, like when, if we go back to that example of like predicting which students are at risk of dropping out, if we risk score them, like this is a core thing that like AI can do for any government is we can risk score. But like if we want to be to measure whether it's good or not, we have like actually, yes, these people with high score actually dropped off. That was good. Bad, we scored a couple students who did not drop who did drop out lower than students who did not. So um, there's a lot of words statisticians and data scientists like using to describe being wrong. Um, so you might hear, uh, hear condition, condition versus uh, false negatives and type two errors, um, false positives and type two. I also keep this on my desk uh, because I even forget this and I do this, but if you hear somebody saying uh, a false positive or type one error, that basically means we predicted something to be true and it was actually false. If you hear a false negative and a false positive, uh, it is, uh, um, it's predicted something was going to be true and we got false. And then you might also hear sensitivity and specificity, which is the sum of, uh, col of column uh, A, uh, which is sensitivity, over the, uh, the sum of column B. Again, you can kind of read this. Uh, the key thing here to understand about machine learning is like there's always trade-offs and you should be able to figure out like whether it is more important to be right all the time or never wrong. Um, and like, you can always optimize your, you know, um, for certain pro projects, it may not be bad that you're never wrong. You're wrong a lot. Cause as long as you're counting all the people who are right and you have the resources to go to all those sites, it's really good. But there are examples where if you're making phone calls. It's okay to make too many phone calls, but if you're deciding who goes to jail or something like that, you don't want to be wrong. On right. That one, right. So this is like, it's very hard to build a perfect algorithm. So knowing which, like what you're, when you're, it's okay to be wrong and when it's not okay to be wrong, yeah. uh, whether that's gonna be, it's okay to have false positives or it's okay to have false negatives is very important. And the rate at which those things happen also is very important. Uh, the classic example of this that people like giving out is a um, medical test uh, that has a, uh, what is it, it was like, a 90% false, uh, false positive rate. So if you, that means of, if it catches everybody, like you take some sort of test to say whether you have a certain disease, it's, yeah, it's 100% accurate. It did catch everybody. But if it also has a 90% false positive rate, that means out of the uh, 10 people it found to have that disease, actually 90 of them were, did, nine of them did not. So it's again, important to evaluate like what is success and what is not success. So understand your problem. And again, as I said, it's trade-offs very hard to get something that's perfect about all these things. Things can go wrong with your model by overfitting. Um, you know, that was probably that last one, that last draw the line through the curve example is probably very, very good at analyzing its test data, but it's pra probably overfits when we start throwing new data at it. So you often hear words like regularization or uh, validation and testing. So validation and testing is, okay, great. We've gotten out, we've trained a model, uh, we've validated it. That's working in that training test split in the historical data table. Testing is when it's, okay, this is completely new data on a trained model. Over the last month, was it actually successful at doing the thing we thought it'd be successful at? So, yeah. Um, bias in your data is a huge issue that you have to deal with with doing machine learning. And this is not a reason to stop doing it, but it is something to be very cognizant of when you're working with data. Um, you saw that uh, our California auto regulators uh, require auto insurers to address rates because we were able to find that there were feature pro proxy features in zip codes that ended up essentially we were giving people higher auto. If you were uh, African American or Latino, you were getting charged more for auto insurance in California because the insurers were allowed to make determinations based on your zip code. They're not. By law, insurers cannot say 
I'm going to charge you more money because you are black uh, or you're a Latino. Uh, but they are able to, they were able, and now they're no longer able to say, I am going to charge you more money because of the zip code you live in. Turns out in a segregated state, much like California, the algorithm that predicts how much money you should pay for insurance was a reflection of that segregation. And you need to be very, especially with location, be very aware of bias like this. Um, this is sort of in the criminal justice system. Uh, we've had a lot of stuff about sentencing algorithms um, that we can't buy, especially if you find yourself in a position where you are buying a machine learning algorithm, it needs to be interpretable. Uh, the state of New York has an algorithm that nobody knows what predicts how long people are going to stay in prison for, and it's not. It's very problematic, and I encourage you to take a look at some of these articles and just see how horrifying this can get. Uh, what I always like to say is people think the bias is coming from the model. The bias is not coming from the model. The bias is coming from inside of your data, which is to say, like, if we go back to that auto insurance example, the bias was not that they picked a model, that the model was good. The bias was that we are segregated. Like, at the end of the day, the challenge that the auto insurance regulators faced was they did give the ability to change rates based on zip code, thinking that's zip code, you know, it's pretty, you know, that seems like it's useful, but the bias was actually coming from inside the data, but it wasn't inspected in that way. So inspecting for that, the bias is not coming from some algorithm making the decision. It's coming from the raw data itself, and the algorithm was just a manifestation of that bias. Um, so this is most of the talk. I'm going to skip this section, except to say this is what I do, send follow-up emails. Um, I think there's a little bit of difference between private and public here which is that we have like a lot of ethical implications to serve and the need to serve everybody versus a company can really segment their audience. So there are some lessons that companies have learned using machine learnings that really aren't applicable to government, especially about like segmenting towards audiences. Um, we have some projects and stuff, but I kind of wanted to get to the workshop stuff. I'll talk about, I'm happy to talk about what I did if you ask me, and, but if you want to pass these out. Yeah. But if you could break it into small groups, uh, we have a little exercise about finding your first machine learning project for your agency or department to do. So uh, there's three columns here. So the first column is what data do you have? The second thing is what do you want to know? And then the third step is what would you want to predict to change what you would do? So for example, if I was that Divi project where we're predicting whether a station needed to be rebalanced, I have historical records about bike share operation and the weather. I want to know whether I need to rebalance a station. So I need to predict the number of bikes that will be in a station in the next hour. So I can send rebalancing trucks. because so I have an, op you know, uh, uh, an operation. So break into groups of three, figure out one project for each of your agency, introduce yourselves and we'll reconvene in, let's see, I wanna give you guys all time to share. So we'll reconvene in 15 or so minutes and then share projects. Hey folks, um, if uh, each group could share one example from their discussion about what they'd like to predict and how, which type of algorithm they may want to use, that would be great. Um, does anybody want to start? Anybody? We'll call on somebody. We will. Raise your hand. Awesome. <laughs> please turn on your please, microphones. Microphones, please. <laughs> Um, so we're a team, we have LA County and LA City, and so um, one of the da databases we had was um, the mental health database for LA County, which includes demographic information, what clinics people visit, where people live, and then like how many times they visit the clinic, like how often, when, reason for the visit. And what we want to do is better serve people uh, with mental illness. And so we want to use this data to determine kind of where more resources are needed based on where and how people um, visit services and how many times. And so we want to predict the pattern of which resources and shelters are visited and used based on location. Awesome. Very cool. That's like a great example. Yeah. Another group? Uh, so the example we took is uh, the restaurant grading, the ABC restaurant grades. So in our system, we have inspection, historical inspection information, complaint information, food holding temperatures, how big a place is, that kind of thing like that. And what we want to do is be able to determine the true risk of a, like the next inspection, let's say, mm -hmm. of maybe getting a B or a major health violation or something like that. Um, 
And so I really want to prevent foodborne illness. And I really want to look at Yelp review data mm -hmm. to see if I can um, pick up something from there. Because I want to predict uh, major health violations and closures, prevent foodborne illness, and um, identify new risk factors that I didn't really know about before. Yeah, so if you can predict who's going to fail their next inspection, you can send inspectors before sooner. Yeah. So if you if you if you have a you have a limited number of inspectors, presumably, mm -hmm. and you want to help prioritize those inspections by sending them in the riskiest places. Exactly. Who's next? Just just do it. Just pull the trigger. Microphone, please. Okay, um, so one we thought about was um, similar to prioritizing limited resources for like the health inspection, looking at prioritizing um, where to spend limited resources on um, pedestrian and bicycle safety improvements. Because um, um, at least for um, City of LA, we have a lot of different data sets on um, safety regarding pedestrian and bicycle collisions. However, that's only reported data. Um, we have a little bit of data on ped and bike activity, things like um, bike share uh, um, locations and volumes. Um, we also have a lot of vehicle data like um, speed surveys, um, congestion vehicle volumes, um, and we do have some data on um, the impacts of different um, treatments um, surrounding bike and pedestrian infrastructure. Data we would need is a lot, lot, lot more data on uh, where pedestrian and bicycle activity is and where near misses or unreported collisions or incidents are happening and when. Um, and we want to predict um, at what locations would safety improvements have the most positive impacts um, and basically get the best bang for our buck for investment dollars. Nice. Every group's getting picked on. All right, it's democratic. Uh, so um, we're in the middle of uh, neighborhood council elections, um, and we're trying a lot of different things to bring out uh, new voices in underserved communities and make sure that they're participating. And uh, one of the things that we do have, as far as data is concerned, is the um, is the information about who is seated in each of the elections. Um, and we can check with a unique identifier um, whether or not it's the same people <laughs> uh, year after year after year. I can tell you that just from my own experience, it generally is. <laughs> um, and, uh, and using that information as well as the amount of funds that they are investing in elections related materials, uh, how we can address chronically vacant seats, meaning there are like either no one's running for those seats or, um, or uncontested seats, meaning that it's just one person's running for it and nobody else is running for it. And therefore um, you just kind of automatically get slotted because you will, you know, you showed up to the table and using that to predict where we're failing in our outreach uh, opportunities and how we can better outreach to say like business seats or youth seats, et cetera, um, and make more sense of the way that we are investing our time and making sure that we are actually providing real opportunities for people to voice their opinions about their own communities instead of who's available at 7 p.m. on a Wednesday. Anybody in the back? <laughs> Hello. Um, so I guess ours is pretty uh, not as exciting as your projects, but <laughs> all projects are exciting. OK, but it do create uh, gives us heartburn. Uh, I'm from the county of Los Angeles and uh, I work with, um, you know, Catherine here, who's from Internal Services Department and Brad is also from the Auditor Controllers Department. So anyway, we have two major enterprise applications, our financial systems and our HR systems. And um, we do we um, have our, our vendor. Um, 
uh, for the advantage application. So anyway, what we have right now is, you know, our HR and financial data. We have a list of defects. We've gone through several upgrades since we last implemented. We have a list of our software defects and that were categorized by um, by severity and all that. And, you know, our start and end date on when these defects were, were issued and when they were resolved. What we want is, um, you know, to find out the... Um, basically how long it'll take for these defects to, you know, basically an average, how long the defects will be resolved based on past performance and stuff. And what we want to predict is like for future upgrades is, you know, what, what on average, what the, um, you know, uh, basically based on historical data, how long it'll, it'll take for the uh, vendor to resolve this issue so we can actually have a benchmark so that, because we're going to have future upgrades so that it's always like a battle for us. It's always like a challenge every, every time we have an upgrade. Oh no, we can do that. Oh yeah, we can do that. But if we have these benchmarks based on the historical data that we have, because we all have these data. It's always a month away. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> oh no, we can do that. Oh, yeah. it's not that simple. So yeah, but if we have these benchmarks, uh, based on uh, historical data, based on their past performance, then we can, you know, then LA County would be better um, equipped with facts and information that, and then say that, um, you know, no, we want something better, way better than, you know, your past performance. So. How meta, using software to improve software. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Anybody else want to share? <laughs> 